back to the same thing, which is, yes, these people are in power, but there's nothing we can do about it. And I remember once saying to one, you know, the problem is whether it's Hamas in Gaza or the PA in the West Bank, all peoples who have been governed by terror entities like this are, of course, always themselves at risk. But the history of human liberation, apart from anything else, has always been people standing up to the tyrants who would, who would rule over them and govern them. So when Hamas seizes control over Gaza after the election and kills the members of Fatah and others, they then make a, they make a deal with Fatah shortly afterwards. And then another one. So where is, you know, the, the, the fine art of this, Piers, is to find the very obvious blue water between Fatah and Hamas. But they keep on destroying that clear blue water well, and about, making it okay, very you murky okay, indeed. But, OK, but you mentioned the West Bank. What about the aggressive expansion of the settlements that's been going on? for the last year, which has been condemned by everyone, including the United Nations and others now. You know, that has been going on. A lot of Palestinian families are being mm. either killed or uprooted or thrown out of their homes as there's this aggressive expansion of settlements, which is illegal. It what? shouldn't be happening. I don't think anyone could look at this and say what Israel has been doing and what Israelis are doing, these settlers there, is, is right and proper and legal. Would you defend that? Well, look, I mean, the thing with the settlements, first of all, I mean, I regard it as being a second order issue because, uh, you know, there's a whole dispute well, it's about It's not the to those who are being killed or displaced, is it? Get into. Well, first of all, say they're being killed and displaced. There's, there's, a, there's a territorial dispute in the West Bank. Uh, that you could see some of the borders, it would be as famously as, uh, as if Livni said, it would be the world's ugliest border, but you can see in the West Bank what a final state of settlement could look like. I mean, it's there. There are areas where the Palestinians are more numerous and there are areas where the Israelis are more numerous, and pretty much you can see with some land swaps what the carve-out would look like. But here's the thing. The reason why there isn't a final status uh, settlement uh, there is because of one thing which is that it is not about uh, whether or not Hahoma or um, other bits of East Jerusalem or the West Bank should have certain areas which should be made clear of Jews, which is, remember, that's the deal, that in a, in a final status agreement, the Palestinian areas in the West Bank, just like Gaza, must have no Jews in them. That's, uh, that's the absolute baseline from which everything starts. That's, that's what everyone's agreed on on all sides. I don't know why, but that's the agreement. I would say it's not about that. Find out what uh, Yahya Sinwar in Hamas or, or, or uh, Mashal or any of the other leadership of Hamas in recent years or, or the leadership of Fatah, what they actually want. And you see again and again, it is not about a, a, a settlement dispute on a hill somewhere in Samaria. It's about whether or not Israel has the right to exist from 1948 to this day or not. It isn't the every single statement, and I can't stress this enough, from the Palestinian Authority of Fatah as well as Hamas, is that the Jews should be out of Haifa, that the Zionists should be out of Tel Aviv, that the Israelis must not be in Jerusalem. You see that they don't want an inch of this ground in this area to be governed by Israel and for Jews to be able to live in it. I wish that these people who, who have come to this mad situation if you, they cared about their own people, an insane situation. I wish that, they, they, that their forebears in 1948 had accepted the offer to have a state, a Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state. I wish that at every point since, when a, a deal could have been made, whether it was at Camp David or many times since, I wish the Palestinian leadership had been um, had cared enough for the Palestinian people that they had accepted the offers on the table. But again and again, since 1948, they have said, no, we will sit this out and one day the Israelis will disappear and that's what we're holding out for. And that is the worst possible thing that they could have said to the Palestinian people, wherever they are, inside Israel, in the disputed areas, or in Gaza. The worst thing they have said to now several generations of Palestinians is, we will not accept 99% of a state if there is a Jewish state. 
That is the reason there is not peace today. That is the reason there is a, not a final status settlement agreement. It could have been there for decades, just like the Gaza. This could have been so different. And the, cons the responsibility to, of that, for that, in my mind, does not uh, sit on uh, one Israeli prime minister or another or a dispute in, the, in a war cabinet. It is on the fundamental inability and reluctance of the Palestinian leadership since 1948 and before to just accept that the Jews have the right to exist in their historic homeland and have a state which they can defend. And whether it's Mahmoud Abbas or Yahya Sinwar, they have spent all of these decades misleading their own people and leading them into the precisely the situation of immiseration and now the horrors of Gaza that we see today. It is on that leadership and their failure of leadership, and it's a tragedy. Why is it then that so many, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelis have taken to the streets to blame Netanyahu? Not because they support Hamas or what they did or try to defend what they did or anything like that, no. but because they believe that Netanyahu massively dropped the ball with what happened on October the 7th. It was a massive security failing for which he will be held accountable when this is over. He's facing corruption charges which he will be held accountable for in court when this is all over. And he won't have the control of the judiciary or the military when that day comes. A lot of people in Israel now believe that Netanyahu is, is continuing to pro propagate this war for self-interested reasons. And they are taking to the streets in gigantic numbers now to express that mm. anger because they believe that that is costing the lives of hostages. As I say, I mean, they're on the streets out of grief, I think, first and foremost. I mean, grief and horror at the situation. But could they be right, too? Not the Netanyahu, they could, could they be right with that narrative about Netanyahu? That actually it's not well, in his we'll interest yeah. to end this war? Uh, I, I mean, look... I, I think it's a sort of it's a cynical and easy explanation that, as it were, the war is going on because Netanyahu simply wants to remain in power. He's already the longest serving Israeli prime minister. So, I mean, it, I don't think he particularly like, needs to stay in power. Um, I, look, you, we can look into the psychology of him, but there's, there's not much point. And as for the, the trials and so on, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But the, the thing that is uh, um, surprising to me, as it were, again, is that people don't see that you can, you can uh, put pressure, exert pressure on a democratically elected leader very easily in any democracy. And that is where people tend to apply pressure because they have the right to. But, but as I say, we, and we've been in this situation before uh, in other democracies, we've had it in Britain as well. Uh, if there's nothing you can do about a terrorist group, it's quite commonplace to put the anger and level the blame at democratically elected leaders on whose watch things have happened. That's just inevitable, but it's one of the things that democracies have to be aware of when they're dealing with death cults like Hamas, is the death cults operate by a totally different standard than the standards of the democracies. And all of the difference in the world exists in that gap. The final question about Israel before we move on to, to other topics. How does this end? You know, I've had guests on, pro-Israeli guests, who say this ends effectively with Israel controlling Gaza as an occupying force. Mm. You know, Netanyahu has hinted at that. But that, of course, is completely unconscionable and unacceptable to any Palestinian. So how, how does this end? Well, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, Piers. Uh, the, the stated objectives of, of Israel's war, of, as I say, to return the hostages and to destroy Hamas, which is, as I understand it, is to make sure that Hamas is operationally incapable. And by the way, they've had a, a very considerable success in that, not just of killing the leadership of Hamas, but among other things, also stopping the perpetual rocket fire, which has gone on for years from Hamas around Gaza into Israel. As the months have gone in on since last October, instead of the daily air raid sirens that used to go on in major cities like Tel Aviv, uh, there's now almost no rocket fire out of uh, Gaza because Hamas has been made so operationally incapable. That's a point that very rarely um, gets brought out. It's not a small thing to stop rocket fire happening all the time against the civilian population. 
Um, but as, f as for how it ends, I, I don't see any appetite in Israel among almost any politicians or the public to have to continue or have to reoccupy Gaza. I don't know any Israeli who, who is desperate to be in charge of making sure that Gaza is on a day-to-day -day basis uh, running well and peaceably. It has been such a hell for such a long time. Whatever you think of Ariel Sharon's pullout in 2005, most people would look back at it now and say, look, w the Israelis didn't want to have to be in control of the Gaza then. It was a perpetual nightmare. They withdrew, a new nightmare began. What the, the final agreement can be on, on the day after Hamas, uh, it'll probably be, it should be, uh, in my view, some kind of international effort, the basis of which you can kind of see, I think, some of the Gulf states, obviously not the terrorist sponsors in Qatar, but some of the Gulf states, that the, the, um, the Emiratis and others have expressed an interest in being involved in some way. The Saudis will probably have to be involved, the Egyptians, the Jordanians. Maybe all of these people who express concern about the Palestinian peoples and who've done so little for them for so many decades could actually do something about that concern put money in, help with a peacekeeping force, help with a police force, and much more. The one thing that cannot happen is that, that Gaza is built back up under Hamas, and we have the same war in the same region a few years down the road. And so what it looks like the day after, I don't know. But, you know, that's the thing about wars. If you, if you start a war, uh, as Hamas did on the 7th, you don't know how it's going to end. The one thing that Israel knows is what is impossible to tolerate. And what is impossible to tolerate is a situation where Hamas has control of the Gaza again and continues to fire rockets again and then does October the 7th again and again as its leadership have said they wanted to do. On that, I completely agree with you. Let's turn to a situation here in the UK several weeks ago, which were these riots that we saw erupting. Mm. Uh, it was a bizarre story to watch. I was in America at the time because it was precipitated by the appalling murder of three young girls at a Taylor Swift dance-a-thon mm. uh, event uh, by what it turned out to be uh, a, a young man who was born in Wales. He, his parents were Africans. They come here legally uh, to the country. They were legal migrants here. Uh, by all uh, est estimation from reports I've read, good members of the community who just happened to have a son who appears to have gone uh, crazy and done a, a heinous crime. And obviously he's now facing uh, a court case which will uh, determine that. Um, what he wasn't was Muslim or an illegal immigrant to this country or on any terror watch list. And yet that became very quickly a false narrative uh, promoted all over social media by uh, a lot of people like Tommy Robinson and Andrew Tate and others who were fueling complete disinformation about who had perpetrated the crime. And as a result, large numbers of thugs came out, right-wing thugs, to exact revenge against people who had nothing to do with it, which were Muslim communities, people mm. living in, uh, in uh, uh, asylum seeker hotels or uh, mosques uh, containing Muslims and so on. So the whole thing was a, a, a bemusing thing to watch unfurl. It showed social media at its worst. It showed agitators at their worst. And it was dealt with very quickly. And we'll come to how it was dealt with in a moment. Um, but in the middle of all this, you got dragged into this for comments. You said not, not while it was going on, but last year in an interview with the former Australian mm. Deputy Prime Minister. We've got the clip which caused all the problems for you. Let's play this. I think I know that the British soul is awakening and stirring with rage at what these people are doing. These pay people came into our house. Many of them broke into our house illegally. Many of them were never wanted here. I don't want them to live here. I don't want them here. In the UK, uh, it's, it's different. Our police force behave differently and policing by consent and all of these sorts of things. But clearly they've lost control of the streets. Now, is it time to send in the army at some point? Probably yes. But if the army will not be sent in, then the public will have to go in and the public will have to sort this out themselves. And it'll be very, very brutal. Now, this was deliberately put back out to try and cancel you. 
And a lot of people, Alistair Campbell, a lot of the usual suspects, Mehdi Hassan and others, what, you know, wanted you cancelled for these outrageously inflammatory remarks, which were not said yeah. while these riot, riots were happening. Just to clarify, who, who were you talking about in that interview? <laughs> it's very clear, it was actually after October 7th, I said, why, why are we in Britain so stupid that we allowed people like former uh, Hamas military commander in the West Bank to, to live in London? Why? What did, what did we in Britain get out of allowing uh, terrorists to live in our midst? Why, why is the former deputy prime minister of Iran who wrote the book justifying the murder of the British novelist Salman Rushdie, why did the man who wrote the book justifying and calling for the murder of a British novelist, why, why is he living in London? Why has he been living in London for the last 20 years? What has Britain got out of this? Why are we so crazy in Britain that we would give sanctuary to people who want our way of life over? And uh, I've, I've still never had a response to that question. I've asked it for many years and I've written extensively about it and I still cannot understand how a society can be so insane that it can welcome in people who want...